There was no hope. People died like flies. Why would a loving God allow this hell to exist? To this day, I don't understand it. One of the darkest eras of world history began in 1938 as Hitler sought to systematically destroy the Jewish people. When he was done, one third of the world's Jewish population was eliminated, murdered, destroyed. Yet there were some Jews who found safety across the seas, others less fortunate who survived in Europe by hiding away in cellars or attics, and still others who endured life in the concentration camps until the war was over. We ask ourselves, how is it that these men and women, these survivors, can go on after what they've been through? Indeed, how is it even possible? How will they learn to smile, to sing, dance, and laugh again? These are the stories of people whose lives were devastated by the Holocaust, restored, and ultimately transformed. They tell their own stories of survival and hope and faith. Faith that came from a most unexpected source. The synagogue was met in my grandfather's house. So yes, we were very active. My grandmother, she was the hostess with the mostess over the town. Let's say there was a family who had a girl and they wanted to get married, but she couldn't afford it. And so she would go to my grandmother and my grandmother saw to it, she has a wedding. My father was a, a barber and a beautician. He had his own shop and in Budapest. Uh, my mother was a, a homemaker and uh, sometimes seamstress. Uh, and I, from what I remember, we had a very, very happy home until the, the war started and things started really to change. And every two weeks, there was a big market for horses. Horse traders came to stay with us, Jewish. More, many were Jews because we kept kosher. They ate with us, they stayed overnight, and then in the morning they went to the market. Where I was raised in Prague, that we were never exposed to anti-Semitism. Not only that, the Jewish people were held in very high esteem. Remember, this was Central Europe, not Eastern Europe. The teacher would read from the Sturmer, which was a German propaganda paper about the Jews. And so he, the kid that very, they had a wrong picture of the Jews and they, so when I came to school an hour later, they would form a circle and they beat me up. I grew up in Berlin and I really don't remember much about my life then. I just, I know I went to school and you know, when I was 10 years old, Hitler came into power and I knew that wasn't good. And then the kids started acting up in school, and my best friend couldn't be my, not just my best friend, she couldn't be my friend anymore. My father came home one day, and there was a, a swastika flag hanging out of our window. The only one. And my brother came home and said, what happened? My brother stepped forward, and he said, I put the flag there. And my father said, why? said, our teacher told us that uh, uh, Hitler 
Hitler is a very good man and he will, uh, he will do with Germany what nobody else could do and uh, he gave us a flag. When you have a scapegoat, somebody like a Jew, you know, that, that caricatures that, that used to be uh, drawn and painted of, of Jewish people with their big noses and, and, and uh, money grabbers and, 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 uh, and they cheat and, and, and they are the reason why they are, why everybody's having all these problems is because the Jews are doing this and the Jews are doing that. Uh, well, if you don't have anything yourself, pretty soon you say, let's blame him. She had the most horrendous mark on her face. She said, you Jews do not come back anymore. Now get out of my classroom. When we went out, there was a barrage of stones from the po uh, Polish people, adults and children, and with a few chosen names. Anyhow, I got bloodied up. A lot of us got very bloody. And there I was with my mother on that now famous death march into Bergen-Belsen. And I remember dimly having not been able to really walk in my mother saying, you have got to otherwise they shoot you. And left and right they were shooting people because whoever was not able to walk was shot. September 1, 1939, the Nazis entered our hometown. And life changed from day to night. Of course, you might realize what has happened to the Jewish people. Many fled. Those who stayed, the older ones, the women, and so on, were gradually taken to concentration camp in Danwitz. Before my parents were picked up, we lived very close to a park. And uh, I went with my father to walk in the park. And we had both, of course, stars. And in the, in the park, it says on all benches, that Jews cannot sit on the bench. So my father said, come and sit down. I said, Papa, we can't sit down. We can't. He said, sit down. So we sat on the bench a while, and sure enough, there came two soldiers, as, as whatever it was. They came, we saw it with a star, and they said, in German, get up. Don't you know that you can sit there? Get up, you dirty Jew. And my father, we got up, my father got up, and my father said, how do you dare to talk to me like this? And he got in his pocket, and he got out a medal. He got in the war. He said, I was in the First World War. How do you dare talking to me like this? Finally, in 1938, we had Kristallnacht, Crystal Night. And that night, uh, all the synagogues were destroyed, and our home, all the windows were broken. We had a lineup in our courtyard outside. Um, my father was beaten up. I spent three and a half years in uh, the worst concentration camps. First in, uh, Ter in the Theresienstadt, the ghetto, then in Auschwitz, also in Hamburg for a few weeks, and liberated in Bergen-Belsen. This time we got caught and put back into the ghetto. You know, we, they were, uh, uh, we figured that would be maybe the best place to go because we had family at that time. Life in the camps, oh, how, how can you describe a hell? Well, we would work from dark to dark. We, we would get up, it was dark, we would go to be counted first. Um, we would have to line up five deep, and as long as the l they are people, walk to the factory, uh, work, then come back when it was dark to the barrack. We would, our food consisted one slice of bread, 
and one cup of coffee, like a chicory coffee, and sometimes a cup of soup. You know, you had to stand and be counted every day, and sometimes that could take all day. Uh, because we had some children in our camp, and from three years on up, they had to stand. Well, you make a three-year-old stand for any length of time without talking or squatting. It's impossible to do that. And when they caught a child squatting or saying something, we stood another two hours, you know, for punishment. And so often that went on all day. Most of my father's family died in the concentration camp. And I don't understand why. And I'm sure God had a reason, but I don't know why. Maybe one of these days I'll ask him. You know, when you come out of this concentration camp, you are feel very guilty because you feel terribly guilty because you see all your friends and all thousands of people dead and you think, why I am alive? It didn't make sense. Why am I alive? I had no idea why I survived. I was not so much crafty and strong, but I have come to a clear b belief that God let me survive to call me to be his servant, and that's all. And I'm sure of that. I, I was diagnosed as having typhoid, having typhoid fever, encephalitis, and uh, myocarditis. Of course, I'm still left with my rheumatic heart disease. Miraculously. There was somebody up there watching over me. I survived this. It's hard to believe. Not even the doctors could believe it. I kept asking myself, what's God saving me for? Because I couldn't understand because there were so many close calls. I'm different. I, I'm a survivor. I hated that name. So I still cringe when I hear it. It was nothing special. It was something I'd done something wrong. That's why. And then the guilt. I survived. Six million didn't. Older than I, more educated than I. I did not, uh, I didn't have to survive. I shouldn't have. And most of the survivors feel that. That's why we never talk about it. I did have a determination and hope. I wanted to survive. And uh, the thing what a lot of people died, a lot of people died because they didn't. They were completely hopeless. God must have had a reason to get me through all these times, all these bad times that I have had, and all the good times. That, and I have some wonderful times in my life. When I hear us, Many of my Jewish brethren, where do you go after you die? All they could say, six feet below, underneath. So there is no hope for more than this life. Many Holocaust survivors have asked God, why? Where were you, almighty God, when this horror befell us? How could you allow such suffering? Some survivors lost their faith entirely. Others regained it, like Rose Price. My mother and the rest of the family were murdered in Treblinka. I was in pre-camps in Poland and pre-camps in Germany. And the beatings were constantly. It's all Jesus' fault. Every time we were hit, the guard would tell us, Jesus told us to hit you. 
Jesus hates you. Every atrocity done to the Jew for the last 2,000 years, it was done in the name of Jesus, including the camps, especially in the camps. We were constantly told how much Jesus hates us because we killed Jesus. Every morning, the Germans would decide what number should we pick today? And one time it was number four, one time it was number five. You never knew on which number to stand because whom they're going to pick. And when they picked you, you went from one line to another line. The only thing on the other line, you were put on chains around your neck, around the waist, around the ankles, and you were chained to the people in front of you and the people in the back of you. You couldn't escape. There was no food. There was no soap to clean. We worked with grease. I worked at the ammunition machine, and I had to put my hands in a bucket of grease to grease the machine, because the machines constantly had to be greased. And there was no soap, and grease does not come off with snow or rainwater or even, excuse the expression, even with urine, because a lot of times that's what we use to wash ourselves. I was raised that God is everything. God in the morning, God at noon, and God at night. God loves me, I am his favorite, God, 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 God. And one day I took a look around where I was in 1941 or 42, and I said, there is no God. My mother lied. Well, what it was like to get out of the camp. Of course, we didn't believe it. When the American soldiers pulled in where we were, where we were held, uh, none of us believed we would start hitting each other, pinching each other. And then somebody came up with an idea of getting even. This person didn't have to repeat. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to kill Jesus. So where does Jesus live? In a church. So what are you going to do with the church? You're going to burn it down. So if you burn down the church, Jesus cannot live there anymore. He's dead. And uh, things were done. We had so much hate. And when we came back to the group, we reunited. I took my sister's hand, and I said, it's time to go home. The war was over, and little by little, I lived in Germany for a while. Many things happened. I started traveling uh, to look for family. And after a while, my sister had, had married and gone to Israel and I was gonna follow her. And then I wound up in America through circumstances. And uh, I lived in Philadelphia. Shortly after I came, I met my husband. We got married. And uh, we I was blessed with children. And many things happened. And one day, my oldest daughter comes home and she says, Mommy, 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 I believe in Jesus Christ. He is the Jewish Messiah. I just couldn't. I just couldn't see it. The same Jesus who killed my family, who put me in a concentration camp, who they experimented on, they beat and they killed. How can you believe in that? How can you believe in a God? I have a hard enough time to believe in my God. I don't need other gods. I threw out my daughter because she believes in him. And I sent my husband into that house. And he became a believer. He didn't want to go to the synagogue with me, even though I had the best seats. And But there he believed. And he comes home, he reads me Proverbs 31. My younger daughter attended a private Hebrew school. 
and she became a believer. My boys didn't want to have anything to do with it, or with me, or with their father. They said, it's none of our business, leave us alone. I mean, it used to be a peaceful, loving house. Jesus comes in and there is war. I said, I'm going to teach them a lesson. I'm going to find the killer Jesus. And I went down the basement and I locked myself in. I looked in my Bible. Now, I knew in my Bible, the one the rabbi gave me, there's no Jesus in there. So I put it aside. I picked up my daughter's Bible and I started reading it and reading it and reading it, and I started again to read it because I knew I missed it. I was about four or five days in that basement. I didn't do housework. I didn't do cooking. I didn't do cleaning. Nobody was allowed to come near me. I was a tyrant. I was a tyrant as it is, but I was really a tyrant at that time. After reading it so many days, and re really rereading it, that's all I did, was sit in the closet, in the bathroom actually, and read over and over and over. And after, I just couldn't find any more excuses. I noticed that he was the lamb, not the lion. And he didn't kill me. He didn't put me in a camp didn't kill my family, that he died for me. Did you know that? He died for me. He loved me this much that he gave himself for me. I didn't convert. I'm Jewish, you see. I found the God of Israel, and to his glory, I serve him. As Rose read the New Testament, she read the words of John, who called Jesus the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Rose knew that Jesus was her Passover lamb. Many survivors were children at the time of the Holocaust. They remember watching helplessly as family members were taken away, wondering each day if they would see one another again. Such was the experience of Bob Cortez. My father was drafted into the Hungarian army. And uh, even then, being a small child, I remember the just happy times, him coming home on leave and, and uh, me fixing his uniform so that he will look sharp. Uh, and never thinking that really bad things are going to happen. Uh, but then when he was, uh, I guess he went to the Russian front uh, with the Hungarian army. And when uh, Hungary decided that Jews were not allowed to be in the Hungarian army, so what they did, they uh, actually took them almost like Slaves. They would have to go and they would have to dig the, the ditches for the troops up front and they would, uh, they would do all the dirty work. My mom put us, my brother and I, into a uh, home like under the protection of, uh, of, of Switzerland and we were not to be touched. My mom, she would come and visit us for a while but then, then she stopped visiting us. I didn't know what was happening to her, but she just didn't come back anymore. And we stayed in that, uh, in that home for a And when I'm talking about a home, I'm talking about, again, a huge apartment where maybe uh, a room, a 20 by 20 room, we had uh, uh, 50 kids. You know, and we were sleeping on, practically on top of each other because, and because all the parents tried to save their children from possibly going, from what I now realize, going to, uh, to concentration camps. I found out later, of course, that my mother was taken to a concentration camp by the name of Mauthausen. And of course, nobody knew where what happened to her and uh, 
And of course, we haven't heard from my father. When the ghetto was first built, uh, they did not have any walls yet made up. They had to get all the, the non-Jews out of that area, so they just set up checkpoints. My brother and I, we decided, oh, I decided that I didn't like that ghetto life because, uh, as I said, I was just a kid. And one day I, I uh, took his hand and while there were uh, all these gentli Gentiles going out of the ghetto who, who had to go, I attached myself and him to a family who has a couple of kids. And we tore our star off and we, uh, we walked off with this family and they were nice enough not to turn us in. I have an aunt who is still alive, I believe, uh, who was uh, uh, not Jewish, who married my one of my uncles. And we went to her house. And she was, of course, scared that she would be found out that she's harboring us. And she more or less farmed us out to some of her family who lived out in the country. My brother went one way and I went to another place and I lived with this family for again for several months until things really started to get hot for them. So back we went. By this time my grandmother was already dead. She uh, uh, in a ghetto we, we slept in the same bed and she died in the bed same with me and, and my brother. I must have prayed because God answered my prayers. Both of my parents came through, and both of my parents came home, which was a miracle by itself. It was about six months after the war that they came home. It was just my mother, myself, and my brother who came to the United States in 1948. Six to eight months later, my, my father came, and, uh, and we were together again. Bob was grateful to God for rescuing his family. In gratitude, he never turned away from God. Yet years later, when challenged by a Christian friend to consider Jesus as his Messiah, he struggled. My friend Gary Jerome, he worked on me for years, and we have had many, many discussions. And I would always say, why do I have to believe in Jesus? I have God. And we would have, not arguments, but some great discussions. I said, why should I, why should I change? Why should I become somebody else? And it took me a long time to realize that I'm, I'm not, that I'm not losing being a Jew. I'm just adding Jesus as my savior. I'm still a Jew inside. I always will be. I, I will never change that. It's only after studying, going to Bible studies and to, to school and, and uh, realizing that um, there's something more. Something must, more must have happened, you know, after the last book of, uh, of the Old Testament. Something, that, that there are too many clues in the Old Testament that there is a Messiah coming and that there is a Messiah here already. And uh, I just, I think it's just faith that, that, uh, that you have that this is the right thing. I, I can't really describe how come I all of a sudden accepted Jesus. I just, I just know that, that it is true. Bob experienced the pain of separation in the ghetto. But now that he has embraced his Messiah, Yeshua, he knows that nothing will ever separate him from the love of God. When we hear a survivor's story, we are amazed that they had the strength to go on. Though the pain is not forgotten, they find healing and comfort in God. Many years after the Holocaust, Marion Parkhurst received such comfort. We were in Amsterdam and we were living there 
in a small place and uh, but first of all there was a terrible uh, experience with the uh, bombing you know uh, every night you had to sit in the down go downstairs and this the bombs are falling and terrible and we knew exactly uh, what planes I could tell the difference between German planes and English planes and American planes I could tell it but anyway uh, one day uh, they picked us up it was just like this and they first threw us in jail in the, the Dutch jail well, it was pretty good compared to concentration camp <laughs> and then they sent us to uh, Westerburg, the holding camp and there I stayed we stayed there for two, three, three months and uh, then they put us in cattle trains with the women and children and men and uh, it was horrible and we had hardly any food and uh, it was smelly and people were sick and it was awful but then the train stopped and then we saw a SS men with the big shepherds and we were told we were in Bergen-Belsen that's where we went and it was a bad experience I really don't talk very much about that then they picked us up I was three months pregnant of all things to be pregnant huh? that was terrible I'm surprised that they, uh, they didn't uh, send me to Auschwitz because I think all pre pregnant people were sent to Auschwitz but I didn't show it at that time at three months you can show but anyway I had the baby over there uh, there was a, a doctor there, a, a Dutch doctor who was also a prisoner who helped me. And the baby, of course, was sick. Baby died in uh, a few days. After I had my baby over there, and I was pretty weak at that time, and one day there was a uh, big uh, confusion in the camp, and we heard that uh, Mengele, that a famous doctor from Auschwitz, is there to visit the camp. So he came to our barrack and uh, the camp leader showed him this and this people were laying in beds and he came to me and he said to him, to me, get up. I got up and uh, he said uh, to Mengele, uh, this young woman here had a baby here and it died. And Mengele said, good. I, you know, I could have slapped him. I just could have slapped him. I just looked at him and uh, he said, well, you are alive, aren't you? I said, yes, and that was it. And I thought by myself, you know, what makes a man like that tick? I don't know. But the next day, something most amazing happened. The next day, Mengele came to our barrack, came to my bed where I was sitting, put something on the bed, and said, here, take that, it might, uh, help you survive and I couldn't believe it he went out not another word and I looked at it a big bottle of vitamins he came and brought me vitamins so then I started thinking what is going on what he must have some kind of humanity in him because in Auschwitz, he made this horrible experience with all these women, with all these people. So I never forget that. Within the camp, there were different camps. I saw every day, I saw big uh, cars with horses, with dead, with bodies on that thing, meat bodies. And they brought them somewhere, I don't know. Every day. Just a very hopeless situation. We were always hungry. And uh, people who went to the garbage cans to pick some stuff up, they were very much punished. And we saw all the suffering. It, it was, uh, I really don't know how I made it. One day uh, in April, uh, in the morning something was going on. You know, we didn't have any news, of course. We didn't know anything. But something was going on in the camp the SS were running around and they were shouting and doing and something was going on. 
and then they had the loudspeaker and they said, everybody in half an hour takes a stuff and start walking. We put you, we, uh, we are going to evacuate. And they gave us three inches of bread each. And uh, my husband at the time was quite ill. He had a fever and he was ill and hardly could walk. So uh, we started walking on the road, about two miles we had to walk. And uh, uh, my husband uh, he says, I can't make it, he said. But then I saw people who were on the road, older people, they, they just dirty Jew, dirty Jew, they said, uh, get up. And they couldn't get up and they just shot us. So I said to Walter, well, listen, we have to walk, otherwise they shoot you. So I, I don't know how I did it. I practically carried him, you know. Marion and Walter were put on a train that was bombed a few days later. Against all odds, they somehow survived and started their lives over. After the birth of their daughter, Karen, they made their way to the U.S., where Jewish believers first told them about Jesus. We, I met, we met Paul and Elizabeth, and uh, they were uh, very good friends, very, very good friends. And he started to talk to me about faith, and I said, Paul, don't waste your time on me, please. It has no sense. It's okay. But then one day he said, the can was maybe three. I guess she was three, four. Well, listen, if you want to be a hedonist, okay, but how about your daughter? Can't you take your daughter to a church? Uh, I have a pick, I pick her up, or other people will pick her up. I said, sure, why not? Go to church. So Karen started going to church. And pretty soon she came home with little Bible verses and the stories, and she wanted me to read her stories. So I read about Jesus and about this, and then I remember uh, John 3.16 she had there, uh, and all these sort of things. I start to get curious, you know? And I said, I called Paul Yates. I said, Paul, uh, what about all this stuff Karen brings home? Where, where, can, where do you find that? He said, in the Bible. I said, he sa I said, I don't have a Bible. I said, you want me to give you one? I said, sure. So he gave me a Bible. And uh, then he started studying with me. And uh, by and by, I, start, I said to him, you know, somehow it's a wall. It's like there is a wall and I can't get over that wall. Something. But then, when I got to Isaiah 53, I said, really got me. And I started studying more and goodness sakes, yes, I was convinced we have got the Messiah. Marion read the words of Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. She couldn't deny that the prophet was talking about Yeshua, Jesus. Some Jewish people survived the Nazi onslaught by fleeing to other countries. Many were captured and endured harsh prison terms. Eliezer Erbach was one of them. At the outbreak of the Second World War, I was barely, I was 17 years old. Life was very pretty good. And then September 1, 1939, the Nazis entered our hometown. And I ran away with five Polish friends. And we went way east, first by train and walking. And then the Nazi armies already caught us called all the refugees and told everybody go back home. So I came home after four or five weeks and found that the Nazis have taken over all the Jewish stores. Also, we were sent Jewish men, whatever Jewish people were there, we were sent to do physical labor. We were sent to cover the trenches that was anti-air trenches that we were, we dug it before the war. A week before the war, we had to cover them. From 16 to 60, all men, Jewish men, were kicked out, were told to leave, were taken to cars, to the railroad, and 
brought to the Russian border, and then they opened the cars and the railroad cars and started shooting. So the Jews started running. I had a, poli a Jewish friend who brought my brother to me, and we were together for uh, till 1940 summer when the Russian exiled us to Siberia. There were one million Jewish people, refugees from Western Poland to the East. They didn't know what to do. They put us on the train and sent us to Siberia. But in a way, they saved our lives because if we would have stayed in German-occupied Poland, there was no help. So uh, from Siberia, we were released after one year. I tried to join the Polish army. I wasn't accepted. And so my brother and I, we, we tried to escape from Russia into Afghanistan. We were apprehended on the Afghanistan border. We were given two years of a prison term. My brother died after a year. I survived after 22 months of Soviet and Russian prison. I moved to Brazil. My uncles invited me to Brazil and I worked in a factory I was witnessed by a, a gentleman who worked in the factory, a younger man, and he has invited me to his church. After a few weeks, I did go to his church. And that first night I was, was a Saturday night. I uh, watched a movie, and that movie moved my heart. I professed to believe that Jesus is my savior. It was May 15, 1955. How do I remember? because he dated the Bible that he gave me in Portuguese. I still have the Bible. Here in this house, you will not see crosses. But you see mezuzah on the old door. And everybody comes here, it's a Jewish home. But Jesus is our Messiah. In the New Testament book of Matthew, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say I am? Eliezer agrees with Simon Peter, who said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jewish families carried out daring escapes, crossing borders and coming close to freedom only to be captured in the end. The Schlams were one such family. But even in the death camps, Vera Schlamm never lost hope. We were a conservative. Jews, and so we definitely had Passover and, you know, had the family, usually big family gathering, 25, 30 people for Passover, and in uh, the high holidays, of course, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. Things uh, get very bad, even on the street, you know, you, you um, often, you know, they would pull out Jewish people, obviously Jewish people, and beat them on the street or make them do things, and, and um, you really weren't free anymore. And then the stores had to have a big sign on them with the Star of David. This is a Jewish-owned store so that Gentiles wouldn't trade there, you know, to boycott the stores. But it also was a good target. And then I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Crystal Night, which was the 10th of November, 38, and I lived through that in Berlin. My mother had arranged for an illegal trip into Holland, which cost money. You know, cost a lot of money. We had to go on a local train to the actual border town, and there a man with a carnation and a lapel picked us up and took us to the border. And on the way, explained to us he was taking us to the soccer fields. And uh, the one goal was on the German side, and we had to run across to the other to the other goal, which was on the Dutch side. And there, somebody would pick us up and you know make a sound like something like that and gave us very careful instructions as to what to say in case we got caught so that he wouldn't be implicated how we got to the border, you know. And then he said, well, don't worry, it's 99% sure that somebody will be there, you know. And I thought, I'm sitting in the car, 15 years old, and I'm thinking, what about the 1%? <laughs> and, and sure enough, nobody was there to pick us up. So we stood there for two hours faces toward each other so if somebody came with a flashlight it wouldn't reflect off our faces. So my father finally decided it was really no point in staying. It would get to be daylight and we would get caught anyway. So on the count of three we ran back across the field 
and um, a board, German border guard came by and caught us and took us to the Gestapo. And I remember walking with my dad and my mother and sister behind us and I said to my dad, don't worry, God will get us out of this. On the 20th of June 1943, they went around, they blocked off all the streets and um, went around with loudspeakers, all Jews get ready, and they just came to everybody. And so that at that time, we all went to Westerbork, which is a camp in Holland. And from there together, we went to Bergen-Belsen then. I would go to my mother's barrack and hide under a blanket for an hour. <laughs> Very scary, but rather than taking a shower, because if you take a shower, you would pushed into this room, you had to undress in front of the guards, you know, who stared at you. Then you were pushed into this little shower room where there were just a trickle of water, many, many, you know, little trickles of water, the shower head, and four people under it, and everybody from the starvation was broken out already, and sores, and so, you know, and you touch these bod bodies, and so I always felt dirtier when I came out, but I just, continued praying that God would get us out of the situation that I never blamed them for. And I felt sorry for people that said they lost their faith. Even I remember one time I heard a man say that and I thought, that's too bad, it's not God doing this, you know. <laughs> Sunday morning we got out and uh, they first took us outside of the camp and, and again had to take a shower there and then gave us some solid food, sauerkraut and potatoes. The amazing thing is after we came to America in uh, Nove November of um, 47, I started, was able to start college in September of 48, even though I had never had high school even. So I was there, my high school dropout. <laughs> so I had no idea what I wanted. I mean, I, you know, my life, my whole life was just persecution. And I didn't think about a future. I only thought of surviving the next day. And, and all of a sudden I had a future and I had no idea. I did so well that my last year I got thrown in with all the pre-med students. And we talked about religion and they asked me questions, I asked them questions and uh, I realized I really didn't know enough about my own faith to you know, be able to answer all their questions. So I made an amazing decision, I said as soon as I'm finished with my training and, you know, have a little time. I mean, they worked there so hard that we really didn't have time. Um, that I would um, start reading a Bible and see what God really wanted for me. And not knowing any better, started in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and worked my way through. <laughs> but I finally did come to Isaiah and found, you know, Isaiah 7:14. Uh, behold, a virgin, I mean, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And the important part is that the Lord will give you a sign because people say, well, it wasn't necessarily virgin. Well, no, the word Alma can mean something else, but in the context, it definitely means virgin. And knowing several languages, I know you have to take a word in the context if it has several meanings. And it wouldn't be a big, I always tell people it wouldn't be a big sign for, for a woman to conceive because I'm a pediatrician and if <laughs> I wouldn't be a pediatrician if that were a big sign from God that a woman conceived. But I think from then on for sure I asked every night that God would show me is Jesus really the Messiah and did he really want me to believe in him. And I woke up at six in the morning and was that still small voice, you know, not audible or anything that said, yes, I want you to believe it and leave all your objections with me. And of course, like every other Jewish person, I thought, what would my family say? How could I do that to them? Uh, you know, what will all the Jewish people say? What will my friends say? How can I go to enemy territory? And, you know, all these things. And God said, leave that all with me. Vera sought after God with a sincere heart, and she found that he kept the promise he made through the prophet Jeremiah. You will seek me, and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I 
I became convinced that there is no other one. Israel now has no sacrifice. It's a religion of works. The 613 commandments, the so-called Tariyad Mitzvot, we are told to do right, to live right, maybe we get there somehow, but there is no assurance of hereafter. The New Testament, we were always told, is strictly written for the Gentiles, not for the Jews. So there's so much Jewishness there. Being drawn to, to Jesus and yet feeling, I, I couldn't believe in Jesus as a Jewish person, you know, and having gone through the Holocaust and all that. How could I go into enemy territory, you know, just thinking. And, uh, and yet when I read that, you know, it's that we turned our faces from him. I couldn't deny that that whole chapter was talking about Jesus. And then I thought, oh, well, that's the King James Bible I'm reading. It's obviously planted to sound that way. So they had the scriptures out in the temple where I went. And the next Friday night, I got the scriptures out and I looked for Isaiah 53 and there it was, same thing. And then I thought, how come I never heard that before? Go forgive and not you. How can you? You can't. Only in Yeshua, only through Him can you forgive. And I'm saying to the people, be selfish, forgive, and get healed. Because you see, when you don't forgive and you keep the bitterness in you, and you keep the unforgiveness. You are with the people you don't forgive in the same cell, in the same jail. But when you forgive, so the Lord puts you aside and he deals with the people who have hurt you. And believe me, his vengeance is much more severe than what you could do. One thing, you know, after I uh, started believing in, in Shua, all the hate left me. I didn't have the hate, and that was very important because uh, uh, hate is uh, really destructive. It just destroys you eventually. Listen to what Jesus said. Just, just listen to him, and then make up your mind. You know, don't just completely swipe it away just because it's a different philosophy or a different way of thinking. It is not that different. You're really talking about your life. For you, you're talking about your everlasting life. And I thought about it and thought about it. And then I said, why to myself? How could we have blamed Jesus what happened to our people? It is the people who did it. He was a Jew. He never wanted to be anything else but a Jew. If I want to belong to God and do what God, what pleases God, I have to believe what he shows me as the truth and as the Messiah who was prophesied in the Old Testament would come. And if Jesus has turned out to be that Messiah, then I have to believe in him uh, regardless of the Holocaust. Jesus is the Messiah that there's no other that we can expect or we can expect his return that's one thing he came the first time and uh, we'll be back the second time and my wife often says well tonight be fine pick up your own Bible there are 328 prophecies from Genesis to Malachi. In the Hebrew scriptures, it's from Genesis to Chronicles. And there are so many prophecies of coming of the suffering servant. Read it. Just read it. And come to your own conclusion. Who am I talking about? You've just heard the stories of people who survived an unspeakable horror and nightmare. Yet, now they are healed. They're at peace. They have hope. That same healing, hope, and peace is available to you now 
through the one true Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. He is the one promised by the prophets, the one we have been waiting for, the Jewish Messiah. Yeshua was born in Israel, in Bethlehem, the city of David. He was born to a Jewish mother, and he lived a completely holy life. He suffered and died a horrid death to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. Even though he died, he also survived. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. He rose again from the dead. This was God's way of providing atonement for our sins. By trusting and believing in Yeshua, in his death and resurrection, you can have forgiveness for all your sins, past, present, and future. You can have hope and healing now and the assurance of life forever with God in heaven. If you're ready for a personal relationship with God through Jesus the Messiah, you can tell him that right now. You can tell God in your own words or repeat this prayer. God of Abraham, I know that I have sinned against you and I want to turn from my sins. I believe you provided Yeshua as a once and for all atonement for me. With this prayer, I place my trust in Yeshua as my Savior and my Lord. I thank you for cleansing me of sin, for giving me your peace and for eternal life. Please help me be faithful in learning to trust and love you more each day. Amen. If you just prayed this prayer, Mazel Tov, God has heard you and forgiven you. He will now begin to fill your life with joy and peace and hope. You might wonder, what is the next step? We want to be able to help you grow in your new relationship with God. We want to help put you in touch with other Jews who believe as you do. Please use the response card that came with this video. Or contact us at 415-864-2600 or the address on the screen. By the way, if you're not yet convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, but are open to hearing more and discussing these matters, please let us hear from you too. Contact us at Jews for Jesus.